Hey, good morning guys, it's uh, Mark here from Sea Wild Earth. Um, sadly, it's a bit rainy today here in Tokyo. I was going to go out and, and uh, go through the steps of a time lapse, um, but what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to use the images that I shot yesterday um, and I will do the tutorial, uh, basically just showing you all of the, the complete editing and the complete preparation uh, process for creating that time lapse. Equipment wise for this particular uh, time lapse, I'm going to be using the <coughs> iPhone 6. Um, I'm, I've got the anamorphic lens from uh, Moondog Labs, just a very small, easy uh, tripod from uh, ground tripod from Manfrotto, and then your regular selfie adapter to hold the phone. Okay guys, well the, uh, this is the um, my iPhone um, and the app I'm going to be using is called Lapsit. Uh, that is the uh, program you can see just above the camera icon. Let's go ahead and open that. Okay, and once you open it you'll see that there are um, my options at the top, new capture gallery and settings, and then a few web links at the bottom of that. Okay, so let's have a look at the settings. Let's go into settings, we'll open those. I've already set the frame rate interval at um, five seconds, so one shot every five seconds. The time scale can be seconds, um, it can be minutes, it can be milliseconds. Okay, I'm just sticking with your regular seconds. Limit mode is frames. I've selected 960 as a limit frame. Uh, initial delays, once you set the uh, trigger going, is 500 milliseconds, and that's just to avoid any vibration or residual vibration from the actual physical touch um, resolution full sensor brightness level of the screen you can put that down to zero or all the way up to a hundred uh, it's up to you um, depending on your situation if you're shooting at night low light uh, you want as little light pollution as possible so you can dial that down to zero um, no schedule I'm just going to set it going on my own you can if you want you can have it you can create a rundown countdown schedule um, if you want to set the system up and then back off uh, and let it start running without you around for whatever reason um, encoding file MOV quality very high frames a second 48 um, I'll put that to 30 actually uh, we're going to just work on 30 frames a second there we go um, I don't want a promotional ending on it and then you've got lots of FAQs and all the other stuff okay so that's my basic settings come back to home new capture and then it's just a oh who's seen one of them uh, and then it's just a matter of lining up your shot um, and setting the time lapse in motion I'm going to go ahead and go and do that set up, set up my time lapse and we'll pick it back up at the app again when I come back in from the shoot um, just to then take you through all of the steps with regards to getting the images and editing them I've got the app open here let's see where we go if I go to gallery you'll see here that I've got one two frame uh, two two sets of images um, and one of these is not rendered this is the render here and you'll see one of the options I've got here is to zip it to iTunes okay the other option is that I can render it in my um, in the app okay if I want to watch the video as it is you have a look here you can see the video that is rendered um, but the problem is it looks very squeezed that's the aspect ratio um, of the image that has been processed within the app I mean it's acceptable 
but it's squeezed because I used the uh, Moondog Lab um, lens. Uh, and so what, what I want to do is I want to have access to that um, so that I can render it and I can post produce it the way that I want to as opposed to how the app decides to. Uh, and the way that I do that is I want to have access to those images so I'm going to send them by clipping zip to iTunes okay and continue and now that's going to zip all of those images of which there are 571 frames it's going to zip all of those images and send them to iTunes okay so we're going to go into iTunes now and here we are in iTunes you can see I've got my iPhone connected here. I'm going to go to the app section and this is the uh, window that you get with your apps um, and if we go all the way down you'll find <coughs> at the bottom here uh, all of the apps that have the permission to write um, files to um, iTunes and if we look at the Lapsit app here you will find the <coughs> the uh, zip file that we've just sent from the app to iTunes. So all you then have to do uh, is save that to a folder destination which I've already done just to speed up the whole procedure uh, but you'll see on my desktop here we are I'm on my desktop I've got a folder called Lapsit and here is the zip file and here are all of the images uh, that are in the file so let's take a closer look at that This is the folder that I created uh, for the images um, and here is the zip file. I've already unzipped it just to save some time and here you can now see all of the images that are part of the time lapse. Uh, these are the, this is now going to allow me uh, manual access to each one of the images uh, in order to get the look I want. But the first problem you can see, or it's not necessarily a problem, uh, this is just the first process in, or the first step in this whole process that we're going to go through today. Um, look at the aspect ratio of this image, okay? Um, it's very squished, okay? Because we were using the anamorphic lens from Moondog Labs, um, what we now need to do is we need to take this image and we need to de-squeeze it. And the way we're going to do that is by creating an action in Photoshop. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Here we are in Photoshop. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up one of the images uh, from that. There we go. There's the file. Start frame number one, I guess. So this is going to be our first frame. Now, as you can see, as I mentioned earlier on, the aspect ratio of this is not so cool. It looks very squeezed and weird. You've got egg-shaped wheels on your bike here. Um, we want to get that added um, real estate, as it were, um, that is given to us when we use the anamorphic lens. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to need to resize this image. Now, we're also going to, that means, because we've got 570 odd frames, is that we're going to need to resize every one of those images. Now, if we were to do that manually, one by one, that is going to be a time-consuming and long, drawn-out affair. So what we can actually do in um, Photoshop is we can create an action, and then we can automate that task in the background so we can then go off and do something else. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to show you, if you don't know how to do that, I'm going to quickly show you how we do that. OK, um, what you need to work with are your actions up here. If you don't see them in your toolbar, um, quite simply, you can go window, sorry, and you've got actions up here. OK, there's your actions showing there. All right. Now, down in the bottom of the actions here, you have this file, the icon, create new set. You put in your new set there. OK, and it could be resize. Give it a name. OK. There we go. Um, and what we do within that one is we then create the action. Now, the name of the action, uh, it's going to be, uh, let's say, Moondog, Moondog D-Squeeze. OK, it's in the set resize. OK, and from there, we are now recording which means everything with this little red light here in the bottom, we are recording every action that we carry out on this file. Okay, um, and the main thing that we're going to do quite simply is to resize it and save it. All right, um, 
So here we go. Now, how do we resize it? What do we do? Okay, you'll look at the, if we go to file uh, image size, you'll see that the parameters of the size are shown here. Okay, um, 3264 by 2448 pixels. Okay, um, now what we want to do is we want to de squeeze the horizontal plane uh, because of the 1.33 times anamorphic uh, characteristic as offered by the lens. So, in order to find out what that is, I just use a calculator down here. Uh, we will take the the horizontal plane of 3264 and times that by the 1.33 characteristic of the anamorphic lens and it gives us 4341.12 okay let's discard the 12 we're going to go 4341 that gives us the resolution that we should punch in 4341 across the top we've untick the constrained proportions because I don't want to adjust the vertical height of the frame okay we'll go okay and there is our frame okay um, that is your image size that is your true frame size now that you're going to use to compile your your time lapse so let's go ahead and save that somewhere file save as and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off of my hard drive I'm not going to store it on the main hard drive I'm going to store it on an external uh, I've got a hard drive set up for my time-lapse um, components I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call that the lapse it toot the tutorial okay let's create that folder okay and I'm going to save that file there you can see it's 4.9 meg in size go ahead and press ok and here you can see save has now been recorded to the action i don't need this image anymore because i'm not going to edit it in photoshop i'm going to edit it later on in lightroom so let's go ahead and file close and that is the end of our action so i can then press stop on the action I've now recorded this action and I can use that as a batch process later on. And the way that I do that is I go over to Photoshop File, Automate Batch. And now what I do is you can see here, if it's not selected, I can, I can select whichever action it is I want. Fortunately, it's, it's landed on these resize. It's got my Moondog D squeeze okay all i need to do now is i need to choose the source folder which is on my desktop here it is here that's my source folder so let's go ahead and choose that okay and destination folder let's go ahead and choose that again this is on my my other hard drive my folder that I created just now on my time-lapse drive let's we don't need to do this I don't think okay so we don't need that let's take that off okay and we're good to go so all we need to do now is just press okay and here we go this now is going is pit is opening up each one of the images from my source folder and it's de-squeezing it automatically and resaving it then to my external hard drive okay this has got 570 odd images to go so i'm going to leave it here and from there we'll come back when we're done um, if you look up here in the top left hand corner it will show you the file name of the files that are being rendered uh, and you can see with this flashing action, I'm sure I'm sorry to those who may get a bit hypnotized with it um, But we're coming up to the very end now And this is just the final frames of the time-lapse that are going through the action that we created earlier on So once this is done, I will be able to show you uh, the rendered files 
as opposed to the original files and you can see the huge difference that is apparent um, with the res especially on the resolution but more more so the aspect ratio um, now it looks at that like that's ready so let's just close down this action window first off let's just have, have a we, we'll have a look at these side by side so let's have a first off look at the uh, image from our desktop we'll go to the lapsit file there and this is just to show you the difference between the two initial files there is your first frame of the time lapse um, pre de squeeze and here is that same file but once it has been de squeezed from the action that we just created and there you go there's the difference if we uh, we can toggle backwards and forwards between the two see one two pre squeeze de squeezed okay it's looking pretty good okay so we're on the road we're on the right track and now we have to take this into our time-lapse editing and uh, image editing software that we're going to use for the time-lapse so I'm going to come out of uh, Photoshop uh, we don't need Photoshop anymore so I'm going to go ahead and close that okay so for this next part of the edit we're going to use uh, two programs um, for the main time-lapse edit that is Lightroom and this program here which is LR time-lapse pro uh, version 4 in fact 4.6 uh, but anyway here's the main interface here on the left hand side down here uh, you can see my uh, directory I'm going to go ahead and select the folder from the time-lapse drive with the rendered images that we've just created with the um, Moondog Labs action in Photoshop. Here's the file here and what the LR time-lapse is doing now is just going to index each one of these images. You've got the main frame here of the first file which is this first frame of the time-lapse here. Um, you've got a, a yellow line which is your exposure um, by uh, medium uh, through the middle of your image uh, and you can see a little bit like slightly over shooting to the right uh, so we're a little bit on the light side which is good because that retains all of the information for the image okay um, once the sequence is loaded you've got a little play so even at this point in time we can get an idea of the general look of how this time lapse is going to be now even as it is now it's not too bad okay i prefer to edit it um, i want to give it a specific look and that's what we're going to go through now okay so very simply when you use lr time lapse pro um, depending on the kind of workflow you're after depends on the procedure that you take because i was using an iphone it's uh, i had no control over the iris um, we just need to work on a very basic workflow and with everything in this software uh, you simply carry out the steps going from left to right and starting at the top each one of the buttons each one of the commands has got a clear label and if you hover over that label it will then come up with an added dialog that tells you exactly what is happening when you use that uh, when you're about to use that feature okay so starting at the top keyframe wizard all this is enabling me to do is to decide throughout the time lapse how many keyframes i want now because this is a very basic keyframe or very basic time lapse sequence i'm only going to have two two uh, keyframes uh, one is at the front, one is at the first image of the, of the sequence and the last image of the sequence. They are indicated by this blue tag here. If you've got one here on the first uh, frame, and if I scan down to the bottom, you've got another one here on the bottom If I, for your last uh, frame. If I wanted to add more, I can just simply drag the slider, three, four, and you can see the, a, third, a second one and a third one. So you've got four in total are then added to the timeline. Okay, they're evenly spaced and it's up to you if you scroll to where your second uh, keyframe is. If you don't, if you prefer another one to be the keyframe, one each side, 
or wherever you can you can place it wherever you want that keyframe to be okay uh, you can add manually or you can add with the slider like i said i just want two which is the first and the last image of this sequence because it is very basic once that's done the next command is to save okay now that that is saved okay all we need to do is we need to drag this quite simply this button into lightroom so we're going to do that we're going to drag it into lightroom which is open in the background that then will highlight all of my images in lightroom and from there we just select all edit select all and import there we go very simple that then comes up with the sequence and you can see once everything is loaded um, that the down here in the bottom of the uh, screen I've got a filter drop down um, if I just want to get the keyframes because these are the only ones I'm interested in for editing uh, we're still waiting for the full sequence to load which is why the last keyframe isn't showing but it will pop up in a minute there is your last frame okay so here's your two keyframes from here we go to editing okay so here we are in uh, Lightroom and so we're going to go on to the edit stage so quite simply we select what I'm going to do is actually get rid of this tab in the bottom just to give me a little bit more space on the edit okay I've got my first frame here we come over to develop okay now if I was um, shooting images for example from a DSLR um, I would have needed to um, crop because of the aspect ratio this now is in a, an aspect ratio that is relative to 1080p, which is going to be my final um, format that I output to. So I don't need to crop this image, but I do need to change the aesthetic. It's urban. What do I like in the urban? I like black and white. So this is a very simple edit, okay? And I'm going to use presets just to speed the whole thing up. Um, I've got a bunch of presets that I got from different locations. Um, some bought some freebies but if you look around on the net you can find lots and lots of different presets for uh, Adobe Lightroom um, I'm going to come into the black and whites because it's urban and for me black and white is urban cool okay and then from here I'm going to let's close this down oh, so I've got even more space and from here I'm going to make the changes that I like for the edit for the look okay um, first off I'm gonna come up a little bit on the shadows get rid of get the blacks back to how they should be so it's not clipping too much you can see the the, the, the uh, blacks are clipping with the blue that you've got there I like the clarity a little bit that's cool okay contrast Again. all of this is just personal how you like to have it uh, vibrance don't need that what I do want to do though is knock down a little bit this noise this noise is a little bit uh, the amount of grain oh, they're on 60 I'm going to come down a little bit of grain is good but I don't want to turn it into uh, nodding the mules lunchtime come down a little bit of there roughness doesn't need to be so rough we don't like it too rough do we folks there we go uh, a little bit, maybe it's too clean a little bit of noise and a little bit of grain is good 30 how's that looking amount yeah okay that's cool but i mean there, there's other things we can do as well vignetting it's it's moody you know so let's have a little bit of vignette and what i'm also going to do is i'm going to add a an nd filter now there are a few nd filters we're editing in this with these presets from our time lapse pro so let's just come up here i'm going to use this 
And what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it over the whole length, height of the image. And this one I'm going to use contrast. Okay, just to give it that edge. Let's go a little bit higher on the El Noir. I like the, uh, the, 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 the shadows. It's just dark. It just rounds it all out, I think, to give it a nice little noir kind of feel. Okay, let's have a look at the shadows. Okay. You know what? I'm, I'm quite happy with that. So let's just stick with that for the moment. Okay. Now, I've made all these changes, okay? And I want to carry these changes over to the second keyframe. So we come to library. Um, let's lift up this bottom tab here. Uh, I'm going to highlight the second one with the command tab. And then at the top of the screen here, you've got this little script. Uh, you click on there and it's sync keyframes. And all that's going to do now is that's going to carry all of the settings over from the first keyframe to the second keyframe. Okay. And then if I need to make any changes, I go into develop. And what I can see here is because the um, changes in the weather um, changed to, and went a bit darker, uh, it means that the overall image here is going to be darker. If I wanted to just pop that a little bit so it's not so noticeable. Yeah, we can make a few little changes here that will make it appear as if everything is still very cool. Let's just go back to where is that vignette? Okay. And then if we want to check and see how both of those look together, there's your first one, there's your first keyframe, there's your second keyframe. And you can see, because of the blue sky that's cleared up and gone to clouds, we lose a little bit of the punch from that vignette, but I can live with that. I'm happy with that. And we have got a little bit of change in the position, which could be caused just by wind. Okay, so anyway, I'm happy with that. Let's come out of there. Let's look at the uh, group. Okay, now what we need to do, because we made these changes, um, if we edit, select all, okay, we need to retain the information that we've made changes in the metadata of the images. So at the top here, we say uh, with the metadata, save metadata to files. Okay. There you go. Progress bar. Boom. That's done. Okay. Personally, then I like to get the full sequence back up. And then from there, we go back to uh, LR time lapse. Uh, very simple now. Uh, we've just edited the keyframes because we've changed that metadata in the keyframes. We need to reload and we're reloading here. You can see the progress bar at the top. Okay. It's reloaded. We're going to now do an auto transition, which is an automatic procedure. There's nothing that we have to necessarily do um, command wise other than click this button. And all this is going to do now is this, this is going to program all of the changes that need to happen between in all of the key in all of the frames, sorry, between the two keyframes. So in order to go from the aesthetic that I edited into the first keyframe into the aesthetic that I edited into the last keyframe, each one of the um, images that make up this time lapse need to have incremental changes made to them in order for that transition between those two looks to be very, very nice and smooth and lovely. Okay. And that simply is what the auto transition does. Um, you've got a deflicker, um, which if there is a little bit of flickering, I normally as a default generally tend to put it about 30%. Okay. You apply that. Okay. You save. 
that then goes through and saves all of that in additional information into the metadata of the files okay it takes a little bit of time for it um, to do so oh it's there then when this is done this is we're pretty much uh finished with lr time lapse at least for now so let's go back to lightroom okay and from here we're in this same frame we're going to go edit select all and we need because of the meta chain metadata that was changed in the process of the auto transition from LR time lapse, we need to read that uh, metadata and this time read metadata from files. And what you're going to see now is each of these frames is also going to adopt the look. You can see them changing color here. They're going to adopt the look that was edited into the initial keyframe and then pass through to the last keyframe um, for your transition look. And so here you can see all of the individual frames changing color uh, and you can see how this whole process is slowly building the time lapse so we'll come back when this is ready okay now all of the um all of the images have been selected the metadata has all been read let's just get rid of this a little bit let's get rid of this bottom there we go um as you scroll up and down you'll see that it still doesn't show that they've been changed, but that's, I guess, is an, an energy saver within the program. But the progress bar at the top is complete, so you know that everything's good to go. Um, what I generally tend to do at this stage is I will pick just one image, and in, the, in that photo, I will go to go to folder in library. And this way, it picks up the folder that all of these images are housed in, uh, and you'll see why this is important I then edit select all and from here we can then export each one of these images as a frame that will eventually be rendered by LR Timelapse Pro okay and the way we do that simply is export and then you get your export file come up your export dialog window you have your um, LR, all of your LRT time lapse, uh, LR time lapse options here. Now, if I didn't go to select the image in the folder, what would come up is a warning box that tells me I'm trying to export just from the directory within um, Adobe Lightroom. Whereas now I've sourced the images in their own folder, um, so it's easier for me to to export them that way. I then select how I want to export them um, for argument's sake I'm just going to have JPEG versions at this time um, from here I can select a destination file uh, and what I generally tend to do is have that destination file just for the um, just for the masters I generally tend to have that on my um, on my own desktop uh, 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 users mark here we go to pictures there I've got a time-lapse transport file here um, let's just create a new folder I create okay and then from there you press OK uh, you give your name the sequence lapse it tutorial let's just say tutorial okay and export and now what that's going to do is it's going to prepare all of these images for export and one by one it's going to create a jpeg file file per frame into that destination file and here you can see up here the progress bar 563 photos ready for export now that's obviously going to take quite some time so I'm going to come back when we're done and we will pick up the a few remaining stages at that point. 59, okay, so just four more to go. Uh, and then what's going to happen is you'll see um, an automatic jump over back to LR Time Lapse Pro. And what that will be will be revealed right now. There we go. It is your render out box. If I just make that a little bit bigger, just to show you what we're dealing with here. 
Uh, it's your render file box and basically just to run through um, your it gives you a codec it gives you your render file the output file name and it automatically selects a file name based on the criteria that you've got in your coding area here um, so we're on ProRes okay um, you, what you can do is if you want to have 720p, 1080p, 3k, 4k, 2k, 6k, all the way up to 8k, um, you can select that parameter here, okay? Or because I'm using the um, anamorphic adapter, I'm just going to leave the source resolution. I'm not going to crop, I'm not going to force output to 16.9. I'm going to keep it as, as I've got it because later on I'm going to do a 1080p conversion using another... Um, software um, frame rate okay my actual frame rate is 30 a second speed one to one quality ultra high color sampling 444 um, and what I generally tend to do is not have any motion blur here you can do if you want um, you've got either low medium or high I choose not to have any and the reason being because I believe that that detracts in some way from the final aesthetic especially if you put color grading and whatever onto your uh, sequence in, in um, Adobe Lightroom um, it just seems to interact with the first and last um, frames so I don't really like that so I generally tend to leave everything here if there is any, anything else that I need to add I will add that in the editing process in Final Cut Pro X okay I'm not going to add any additional sharpening and I'm not going to put a copyright overlay so all that remains is for me down here just to press render video and in the left hand lower frame of the screen here of the user interface on LR time-lapse Pro um, you're going to get a progress bar for the export of your file okay um, and again it's a process that takes a bit of a while so I'm gonna leave it here uh, and when we're done here I'm gonna show you how I convert my file in order for me to be able to use it in Final Cut Pro and I'm gonna show you another little bonus that you can use um, that will allow you to add a bit more dynamic uh, into your final time-lapse okay so we'll pick it back up uh, when this is finished rendering catch you then Okay, so we're just coming up to the end of uh, the export now from LR Time Lapse Pro, and we'll get a little ting in a minute, and that will give that will be the signal that uh, the file has been rendered. There we go. That is the uh, the signal that we're done with uh, LR Time Lapse. So I'm going to come out of here, quit LR Time Lapse. Okay, come to Lightroom. Let's quit Lightroom as well do, 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 do. okay so here is MPEG stream clip this is the software that I use for all of my video conversions it's a free little software and it is so incredibly uh, strong it's awesome but anyway so we're going to open the file we're going to open the file that I've just created with LR Time Lapse Pro uh, Desktop, we're gonna go do, 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 pictures, time lapse transport. Where is I? Oh, there we go. Okay, this is the file that LR time lapse has just created. If I want to have a 1080p version, uh, I need to create that, and I'm going to do that very quickly here. Uh, export to QuickTime. You have all of your codecs here. Um, I'm going to use uh, ProRes 422HQ, have everything nice and high res. Quality is way up there. i um, going to go for MPEG 4 stereo, 48 kilohertz, 256 bytes. Okay, here's your main uh, resolution. I'm going to go down to HD, frame blending, deinterlace, 30 frames a second. Ooh. 30 frames a second, deinterlace and make movie. And I'm going to put that in the same folder, but all I'm going to do is just change the uh, HQ, HQ, and also indicate that it's 1080p and it already is 30 frames a second. So let's just put that in there to confirm as well. Okay.
and save and now that then is going to save my file okay so this is uh, this is um, going to be quite interesting um, this is a copy this is now the 1080p version that we've just created with mpeg uh, stream clip um, and if you take a look at this I, mean, I think it looks pretty damn cool I, I like that I really like it it's gritty, it's edgy, and it's it's certainly a time lapse that, that is deserving to be in any in any project, in my view. Um, I like it. Anyway, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But what I find is going to be very funny is to look at uh, in comparison what we got from the app um, once the app had created its version of our time lapse. So let's just go and uh, find that file that we got from do, 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 tutorial is yeah that one there okay this is how the app would have given us our time lapse uh, bearing in mind that the first few frames are going to be all over right there we go we'll play it from there this is how the app would have rendered it and okay i mean it, it's not bad but uh in comparison to what we've done with the steps that we've taken today and it's just really I mean when you think about it it's just a couple of hours work and the effort that you put in it's it speaks volumes I mean this let's get rid of that over this nah, I know which one I prefer <laughs> and it's hard to imagine that these are both actually the same all of the same images but anyway there you go. I'm going to take this into Final Cut Pro now and I'm going to show you a little couple of tricks that you can add um, to your time lapse that will create even more kind of production value uh, to your project. Okay, so let's head over to a Final Cut Pro. Okay, so this is Final Cut Pro. Um, I'm, I've got a little project set up here. Uh, but I just wanted to show you how you can add a little bit more dynamic into your final time lapse. Um, first of all, we need to go and grab it. So let's go and just quickly grab those two files that we just created. Um, where are they? <laughs> uh, it's on my there. users. Let's go to pictures. Where's my time lapse transport? Okay, Here's, these are the two um, files that we just created. We're going to import those. Okay, there they both are up there. Okay, so this is this is the first file. This was the the ten eighty p version. Uh, as you can see, that's playing quite nicely. So we can make this a little bit bigger, actually. There we go. We'll fill that middle screen. There we go. Cool. Anyway, so here's your here's our first file. Looks great. I love it. It's certainly a, a big big difference over that uh, over the initial uh, time lapse we would have got if we were happy to accept just what the app gave us. But there is something else that we can do to improve a little bit of the dynamic of of a time lapse, bearing in mind that we did um, we were shooting. Uh, a static time lapse uh, and the trick is by bringing in the 4k master version and you can see it's the 4k because it needs to be uh, rendered which is what this orange line up here is doing um, it that's what that indicates and it is slowly rendering here um, but what it means is that even though you see it in full on the timeline you've got a huge amount of resolution size available for you to play and to do with as you like. Now what that means in, in layman's terms is if we reduce this pane here and then fire up the wire image what we can actually do is on the scale slider up here is we can boost that up to wherever we want to have it. Now, I'm actually going to boost it to about 120 percent okay now, I'm not going to it's not really going to be oops, there we go, 120%. What I'm then also going to do is I'm going to change the position of where our frame is. I'm going to put it up here. Bearing in mind, this is on the first frame indicated by this frame holder here. 
This is the first frame of the sequence, okay? Um, and what I'm then going to do is I'm going to keyframe that. I'm going to add that on the position here as a keyframe. I'm then going to grab, I'm going to go to the last frame of the sequence. And I'm then going to, on the keyframe, add another keyframe. But I'm now, I'm going to change the position. I'm going to change the position of the keyframe. And what you can see happening, I basically added a pan. A little bit of motion into the screen, into the clip, just to give it, a, and it's going to stutter on playback because it's still rendering. So basically, what I've done is I've let, we can now undo that. We can go back to fit to screen. Basically, what I've done is I've I've expanded, I've I've zoomed into the image by twenty percent. Uh, we haven't really lost any dynamic of the image quality because we've we're, we're playing with a four K resolution file on a 1080p timeline uh, and basically what that is allowing us to do is to add motion um, by adjusting keyframes and positions it allows us to add a little bit of motion one more added um, dynamic feature on an already good time lapse but a time lapse that was missing just maybe one final element and that element is motion and you can see now by running through the time lapse here that that motion certainly adds a very cool dynamic to the image okay and you even get a ramp up and a ramp down there we go i think that looks pretty awesome Cheers guys, all that remains is for me to say that I trust you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope that it helped you in your understanding of shooting time-lapse and the steps taken to give your work and its production value an added boost. If you do have any questions, please feel free to post in the comments below and of course to hit that channel subscribe button. So cheers, happy shooting and I look forward to bringing you more tutorials down the road. Thanks.